Well, you know, I had a few people come up to me this morning and say, Scott, what are we talking about this morning? As if they thought we was going to do something besides the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but we're not. We're still in the Gospel of Mark. But, you know, we're over the halfway point and it's only taken us the year to get there. So we're doing really good. As uh, Richard reminded me, Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, and so we ought to be thankful I'm not picking one of the longer Gospels to go through. But we are going to continue through the Gospel of Mark, and we are in chapter 8 this morning. And I'm going to read to you this passage uh, in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. If you're using the Pew Bible, that blue Bible, it's on page 714. You can go ahead and start turning there if you would like. But we're going to read in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 8. I got distracted because I feel like it's really dark up here. Maybe my eyes are going dim. I don't know. It does. But we are here in Mark chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 31. And the word of the Lord says this. He, Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and he said... If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the good of the gospel will save it. What good is it for the man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, that is our passage for the day. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I do some of my sermon prep because whenever I get started, you're going to think this is ridiculous maybe, that this is what I'm fascinated with. So I spend about a week looking at different stuff, reading things, going through the text myself and tearing it apart, trying to make sure I know what it says. I'm reading other sources that give me some of that cultural, historical background that maybe I'm missing. And then I sit down about Thursday or Friday and I start reading the passage, prepping for Sunday. And so with all that information already in my head, I read the passage once and twice, usually a third time, usually a fourth time, and all of a sudden things start standing out to me that I find interesting and I go, how many people would have missed that? If I didn't sit there and read it over and over again. How often have I read through this passage and I've missed some of this stuff? Until I do that. And in this passage, the one thing that really stood out to me was a big four-letter word. Uh, no, it's not a cuss word. I'm going to be able to say it without anyone getting upset. The word must M-U-S-T. And what I began to think about is the necessity of must. You know, there's a lot of words that could be exchanged for must, but they have different meanings. In this passage, twice the word must is used. 
The word can is not. Can means you have the ability to do so. It's a possibility. May means it's a possibility and you have permission. But must means it's absolutely necessary. Right? When we use the word must, we're not using it to say maybe. There's a difference there. Must means it is an absolute necessity. That's what the word means basically by definition. And so the first time it appears is in verse 21. In verse 21 it says this. I'm sorry, in verse 31. Silly me. Verse 31. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and after three days rise again. Okay, I lied to you because there's three times the word must is used twice in this one verse. And so as we read this verse, we realize what Jesus is saying. It's non-optional what's about to happen. It's non-optional that he is going to be rejected. It's going to happen. It's an absolute necessity of what it means to be the Messiah. What it means to be the Christ. What it means to be the Savior. He must be rejected. He must suffer. He must be killed. And as we looked at this last week, we saw why, Jesus, why Peter had such a struggle with this because that was not his understanding of a Messiah. But what we see here in this word must and the necessity of it in verse 31 is it's the cost of being the Messiah. Because he's the Messiah, these things will come to pass. And 2,000 years later, looking back, we can see, yes, in fact, they did come to pass. But the word must is used again in verse 34. If you look at verse 34, it says this. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now in that verse, when we read that, we did not say, if the culture dictates it, a disciple may have to pick up a cross. The disciple may have to suffer. The disciple may have to deny himself. It doesn't say that. It says a disciple must do that. It's an absolute necessity of being a disciple. Now, let's take just this verse, just this portion I'm talking about. What is that cost of discipleship? He must deny himself. To be a disciple of Christ, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. You must follow Jesus. Now, all three of these words, what's interesting about these words, and we really need to hear it today, is all three of these words are action words. These are not passive words that just happen. These are active things you must do. And you know what? For a long time, the Protestant movement of which we are a part, we hate to say there are things we must do. No, we're saved by grace and we don't do anything. We're passive about it. Grace is cheap. Discipleship is cheap. It doesn't call us to do anything. Is that what this says? I don't read it that way. There is a doing aspect, an action aspect of this. If you want to be a disciple, it's not about being passive, it's being active. And not only active, specifically active in at least three things. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. Now, if you want to argue with me, you can, but you're arguing with Jesus himself. 
And in case you're worried that maybe it's just found in Mark and maybe Mark mixed it up. No, it's found over and over and over again in Scripture. So let's take a moment. And let's look at what it means. What is the cost of discipleship? What does it mean that you must deny yourself? That's a good question. And I think sometimes we can get into the habit of falling into this trap of saying something to the fact of harder is holier. You have two choices. They are both okay in the sight of God. You have two choices. But if you want to be holy, you're going to pick the one you don't want to do, the harder one. You can have that steak, you can have that beautiful steak on the grill, or you could have a week old McDonald's sandwich and you go, well, harder is holier. I don't really want that McDonald's two-week-old sandwich, so I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to eat that instead of the steak. I don't think that's what that means, but there has been movements within Christianity that have taken deny yourself in this manner. Again, I don't think that's our problem in today's Christianity in America, but historically there's been those movements that that's what that's meant. That's not what this means. To deny yourself means that when your desires and your wants come in conflict with God's word and God's will and what God wants, you're going to say, no, I'm going to deny myself. I'm not going to do what I want in this situation. I'm going to do what God wants. It's all about saying yes to God. Now think about this. There are times where those things line up. Where your desires and your wants, they line up with what God desires and wants. And saying yes to God is wonderful. You don't have to think about it. You're not denying yourself. You're getting exactly what you want. But there's times where those things don't line up. And when those things don't line up, you have to continue to say yes to God. Which means you have to deny yourself. And while we're going to get to this whole pick up your cross thing here in a moment, when it comes to this, let's think about Jesus who carried that cross. Guess what? If you read scripture, he didn't want to carry that cross. Let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way, let it be done, God. But what does Jesus do? He denies that humanity in him and says, No, I need to say yes to God. And praise be to God, he did. Because that's where our salvation is found, is in Christ. But we have this beautiful example of Jesus, in fact, denying himself to say yes to, Jesus, yes to God. That's what it means to deny yourself. Later on in the explanations, as Jesus continues on, he talks about you will die to live. And we go, well, that's kind of oxymoronic. That doesn't make sense. But it does, because that's this idea of denying oneself. And so it's not about harder makes holier. It's about saying yes to God. But then this next action that we have is to take up your cross. And this is one of those things where we go, well, what does this mean? In the Roman world, everybody understood what Jesus was really talking about. They understood what the cross meant, that it was a horrible, horrible torture device that would ultimately lead to death. And what makes this so amazing is up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has not said, I have to go and die on a cross. So he could be using this more figuratively than literally when it's talking about he himself. 
But what does it mean to pick up your cross when in fact we live in a world that the cross isn't used? If we must do this, what does it mean? Well, I've been pondering on that as well, and I think a good way to think about this is cross. There's two different types of crosses. There's chosen crosses, and there's crosses that are given to you. And in both cases, you are still taking them up, and we're going to talk at length about this. So let's talk about chosen crosses. A cross is something that you yourself have chosen, you yourself have said, I'm going to do. Through thick and thin, it might not be easy, it might not be pleasant, it might not always be what I'm hoping for, but I have chosen it and I have committed to it. Maybe you could think of that as being a Steelers fan. Okay? Maybe that'd be a good way to think about what it means to choose a cross through thick and thin, regardless of what happens, and they'll never get to the Super Bowl again, but I'm still going to cheer for my Steelers. I was going to say Broncos, but I don't think we have Bronco fans. So went with Steelers. Just for you, Maggie. But now let's take this and maybe take it out of that little bit of a humorous context, although I think I'm going to get a little humorous still. What are some things that we choose for ourselves to take on that we must continue to say yes to God with, yes to that commitment with? For one thing, I often really do think about things like uh, marriage would be one through thick and thin, we're going to get through this. I'm going to continue to say yes even in the hard times. I'm going to continue to say yes in the good times to this commitment that we have made with God. So quite literally in this sense, Judy, Richard is your cross to bear. So that is what it means, a chosen cross. I think of this also about being ordained, an ordained minister. Coming here to this church, I have made a commitment to this church. And each and every day through thick and thin, through the ups and downs, I have to continually get up and say yes to God. And yes, I'm going to keep this commitment. Even when things get hard, even when things don't look great, I have to keep saying yes. When people complain about things I think very minor and I get really frustrated about, I keep saying yes because I have a commitment to God. And when we start seeing our attendance start going back up like it is right now, in those good times I keep having to say yes to God. It's not about me, it's about God and saying yes to God through the good and the bad. Doing two funerals in two weeks, I had to keep saying yes to God. Those kinds of things. And the church is the same way to the minister. Even when he says things you don't like, even when he might change things that you wanted to keep the same, you have to keep saying yes to God. You've made this commitment. What about continuing to move into the church. What does it mean to be an elder or a deacon and make that commitment? What does it mean to be the treasurer or the financial secretary or the chairman or vice chairman? I'm trying to think of all these positions. What does it mean to say yes to that position and continually wake up each and every morning and say yes to God, yes to this commitment that I have made through thick and thin, through the good and the bad? Those are the things that are crosses that we have chosen. And we must keep choosing them and saying yes to it. But there's also something called given 
crosses. Crosses that are given to you. You don't want them necessarily. You haven't asked for them necessarily. But they have come upon them. And you still in those moments have to find a way to say yes to God that through you. I I can't choose this. I don't want this. But I'm going to engage with this cross. I'm going to attack this cross. Not with my strength, but with the strength that comes through Christ and that relationship with him. And we have a lot of these we could think about. In this congregation, we have a lot of these that we could think about. Think about having that cancer diagnosis. And we have a lot of those. Being able to still say yes to God even in the midst of that struggle. I didn't choose it. But I'm going to engage with it. And I'm going to attack it, not with my strength, but with the strength of Christ. What does it mean if you lose your job? Or you go through a divorce? Or you go through some sort of abuse? I didn't ask for it. I don't want it. But I'm going to engage with this. I'm going to attack this, not with my strength, but with the strength of Christ. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to throw up my hands and say, no, God, this is too much. I'm going to keep attacking it with Christ's strength. As a church as a whole, what does it mean to go through a pandemic? We as a church, we didn't ask for it. We didn't want it. But we're going to continue to engage in that and we're going to continue to... Uh, attack that, not with our strength, but with the strength of Christ. We're not going to give up. We're not going to throw up our hands and say, no more. These are crosses we're not asking for. We don't want them. But we know that we are to take up that cross that has been placed upon us, and we're supposed to engage it. And attack it. You know, think about that time where your loved one passed away and you weren't ready. And I don't care how old you were, and I don't care how sick they were, you weren't ready. You have to get through this grief. And this grief that you are going through is not going to be easy. And you certainly didn't ask for it. You certainly don't want it. But through the strength of Christ, you are going to engage that cross and you are going to attack that cross. So what is the cross in your life? Chosen or given? You have both. How are you engaging those things? Are you continually saying yes to God or are you giving up and saying yes to your own desires or saying, I'm just going to give up? How is this? How are you engaging with the crosses in your life? But it tells us something else as well in this passage. Not only must you deny yourself continually saying yes to God, not only must you take up your cross, whether it's chosen or given, but you are also to follow Jesus. What does it mean to follow someone or something? What does that mean? How do you do that? One of the things I love doing is I get a whole bunch of toddlers together and we we get in a line when we get ready to go craft. I say, get in a line. And of course, the first time kids are doing it, they're all over the place. After a few weeks, you start getting the older ones to understand and the little ones fall in line finally and they start figuring it out. And we we always walk from one end of the fellowship hall to the other where we end up going and doing our craft. But there's a few times where I go, oh, I want to have some fun with this. And I take them and we start walking in circles and doing all this crazy stuff that these kids aren't used to. And they're going, wait a second, I want to go do my craft. He said I'm going to go do my craft. 
craft. Why am I doing figure eights in the fellowship hall? But do you know what? Almost always, those kids do figure eights in the fellowship hall. They don't just say, nope, not my thing. I'm going this way because I want to do the craft. You might have a strong-willed person that does it, but most of the time, that's not what happens. They follow. They were given that direction. And whether they think it made sense or not, they know that's what they were told to do, and they're doing it. So what does that mean, to follow Jesus? Have you ever been following Jesus and go, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. God, I don't want to be here. I want to be over there. The question is, are you following Jesus? Or do you get out of line and go where you want to be and say yes to your own desires? Or do you say yes to God? As I talked about yes, last week about making sure you have a full understanding of Scripture on all these topics that you want to talk about. We went through that last year. Watch YouTube if you weren't here. When this tells you to do something, when the Word of God tells you to do something, and you know that's what God wants you to do, do you do it? Or say, that doesn't fit into what I want. Do you follow Jesus? Or do you follow him as long as he's going where you want to go? That's a, that's a real question. There's a lot of places that it's easy to go if you want to get there. It's easy to follow someone if you're both going the same direction. But when that leader says, no, I want you to go do something else before you get there, do you say, yes, I'm following the leader. I am following Jesus, who is the head of the church. Or do you say, no, I still think it's easier if I go my own way. Jesus will meet up there if you ever get there. You might not use those words, but we've all done it. What does it mean to follow Jesus? To get behind him and go wherever he tells you. Now, I have three more verses. Luckily for us, this is really the ending that we read, verses 35 through 38 is really a description in different words to describe the thesis that we just read in 34, that we must, if we want to be disciples of Christ, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we praise You and we thank You for the blessings You've given us. That we are here this morning. And Lord God, it's hard to be a disciple. It's hard to deny ourselves. When we want to do something, when we have our own desires that are in conflict with you, it's hard to deny them. But we're called to. Lord God, give us the strength to do so. Lord God, we have a lot of crosses in our lives and they're hard to bear. They're struggles we have. But let us never give up. Let us continue to engage them. Let us continue to attack them. Not by our strength, but by yours. And give us the courage to follow you, even if we're going areas we don't want to go. Even if we don't understand the directions you're giving. Let us have the courage to follow you. And in all of these things, we do so.
by asking you to empower us with the Holy Spirit and strengthen us with your word. In Christ we pray, amen.